Well, this morning we are continuing on in our sermon series through the New Testament book of Acts, and we're looking at chapter 21 this morning. Uh, Our text is going to be available on a screen, but if you have a Bible and would like to turn there, the book of Acts is toward the back of the Bible, or you could look at a phone app. We're looking at chapter 21, and why are we looking at Acts chapter 21 this morning? The simple answer is because it comes right after Acts 20. And I hope that that as we look at this passage together, you will be convinced that we as a church uh, do not shy away from the difficult passages. We don't just pick and choose the fun things, things we want to talk about, but we're not afraid of a good travel log. Um, But as we we journey across the Mediterranean with Paul, I hope you will see that it's more than a travel log that is actually the recounting of what God is at work doing um, as he is extending his kingdom uh, in this world. And that's what the book of Acts is about. It's about how Jesus is at work in our world, extending his kingdom, and he's doing it by the power of his Holy Spirit as churches are being multiplied all throughout the world. So being, being a Christian simply means to be a follower of Jesus. It means following King Jesus. And very often, it means following King Jesus to the cross. And Jesus always had the cross in his mind. It was always before him. That was the destination. That was Jesus's mission. That is why Jesus came into this world to go to the cross in order to die, to pay for the sins of people like me and like you so that we could be forgiven and rescued. And so um, the author of this book, Acts, his name is Luke, also wrote the New Testament book called Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And in the Gospel of Luke, there is an extended travelogue, similar to what we're going to encounter in Acts, an extended travelogue where Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem and all of the rest of the action and the movement is about this journey toward Jerusalem where Jesus knows that he is going to suffer and die. And today is Palm Sunday, where we remember when Jesus came to the end of that journey to Jerusalem and he entered into Jerusalem. It's called the triumphal entry. And that leads up to this week that we're stepping into called Holy Week, that will eventually lead us to Good Friday, where Jesus dies on the cross, and then to Easter, where Jesus rises from the dead. But whether, whether or not we think a lot about the church calendar, whether we give it a lot of weight, all of us need to reflect on the fact that Jesus very intentionally went to Jerusalem and he did it knowing that he was going to suffer and die. And there's a lot of clear parallels that Luke wants us to see between Jesus's journey to Jerusalem and all the things that would take place to him there and Paul's similar journey that we're going to look at to Jerusalem and what he will encounter there. And it's because Jesus has already journeyed to Jerusalem. He's journeyed into suffering and death that Paul and we can find courage journeying into our own suffering. So let me invite you to look with me at Acts chapter 21 We'll begin in verse 1 and read through verse 26. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais. And we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. 
while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. God, we ask that as we look to this portion of your word, you would convince us that this is exactly what you want to be saying to us this morning. Holy Spirit, would you meet each of us where we are? Would you encourage us where we need to be encouraged? Would you challenge us where we need to be challenged? And would you do what you love to do, and that is shine a spotlight on Jesus. Help us to see him in his beauty, see what he is at work doing in this world. Help us to reflect on the significance that he came and went to Jerusalem in order to die and rise that we might have life. Would you use these events to encourage us as you call us to follow him. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, this weekend, my wife is with our two daughters uh, doing a a college visit. They're visiting a, a college where one of my daughters may end up spending the next several years of her life. And I was talking with one of you uh, recently about this, and that led to me being asked the question of how I ended up at the college that I went to. And uh, the answer is that um, after considering several schools, I chose the place where I was sure I would be most miserable. And, and that's, actually, that's actually true. I'm serious. I visited this school and went on you know, this campus to visit. I thought, this, school, this would be terrible. Um, I would not enjoy this one bit. Uh, but I, I had this strong sense that God was calling me to go to this place for a variety of reasons. And so I went. And you know, when you go on a college tour, if you've ever been on a college tour, you know, they always put their best foot forward and they want to show you all the great stuff and tell you all the exciting things. And there's lots of hype. And so there's always a concern that maybe the actual experience won't live up to, you know, the big fair day. Um, But in my case, the actual experience was exactly what I expected. I was totally miserable. Um, (laughs) It was terrible. And I actually ended up transferring after just one semester. I went to a different school, but I never would have ended up at that second school had I not gone to the first. And it was at that second school that God did lots of different things in my life, connecting me with various people and churches and really set the trajectory of much of the rest of my life. But that's another story. I intentionally went somewhere that I thought would be miserable. How are we to think about hardship and suffering? Well, in this passage, um, 
it's a, it's a travel log, largely. It's a journey. And so our points aren't going to be necessarily parallel points, but they're going to be mile markers, milestones, as we take this journey together with Paul. And in this passage, we're going to see that the Christian life is often a journey toward suffering. And it's a journey that is characterized by following our king. And it's a journey that is supported by fellowship. And then ultimately, the Christian life uh, is about becoming all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. So the Christian life is often a journey toward suffering. You know, sometimes we look at the road ahead and we can see and anticipate that it is marked by hardship and suffering. And sometimes Jesus is actually very clearly leading us into suffering. That was Paul's situation here. Paul was on his way toward Jerusalem. In the last passage that we looked at in Acts chapter 20, Paul had been reunited with some of his close friends who were elders at the church in Ephesus. And then he leaves them to continue on his journey to Jerusalem, to sail to various ports. But before he left them, he says in Acts chapter 20, this is verses 22 and 23, He says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So Paul felt very compelled by the Holy Spirit, by God, the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And simultaneously, he was convinced that the Holy Spirit was also telling him, hey, it's going to also be really hard and miserable there, and you're going to end up in prison. Well, along the journey, um, in chapter 21, verse 4, when they get to Tyre, Paul and his companions connect with some other disciples, some other Christians. And Luke tells us, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And... And we see this kind of along the way that people are, people are telling Paul, hey, it's going to be really bad there. It's going to be really hard. It's going to involve suffering. Bad things are going to happen to you. And, and most of these people actually encourage Paul not to go. When he gets to Caesarea in verses 10 through 12, Luke tells us, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt And bound his own feet and hands and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. So Luke is saying, hey, me and the traveling companions and these Christians who were in Caesarea, we're all telling Paul, look, the Holy Spirit said this is going to be awful. We don't think you should go. Why would Paul go? What would be his motivation? I mean, usually we try to do everything that we possibly can to avoid suffering and discomfort and difficulty. Why would you walk knowingly, willingly into it? Well, Paul tells us that his driving motivation was Jesus and the gospel. In verse 13, then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He had said something very similar to his friends, the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 24. He says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And so Paul says, the thing that animates my life, that I am most energized by, the calling on my life is to proclaim this good news of grace in Jesus to all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And so if the pathway to do that involves suffering, well, I will gladly go. So the journey of following Jesus very often is a journey toward suffering but it's a journey characterized by following our king. Jesus has already walked this path before Paul and before us. Luke writes in chapter nine of his gospel, verse 51, that when the days drew near for him, that's Jesus to be taken up, so he's going to die, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. 
Later in Luke 18, verses 31 and through 33, Luke tells us, And taking the twelve, he said to them, Jesus said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. Those are the events that we remember taking place this coming week. Jesus went to Jerusalem on purpose, knowing that he was going to suffer and to die for people like me and people like you. He did it for us. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you are not called to die in order to pay for your sins. You're not called to suffer or do some kind of penance to make up for the bad things that you've done. Jesus has already paid the entire price on the cross through his death. But Jesus does tell his followers to take up your cross and follow me. One of Jesus' closest friends, Peter, writes in his letter called 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So Peter is also saying following Jesus involves following him into suffering. But how would we ever find the courage or the motivation to do that, to walk intentionally toward suffering? That's not our natural, that's not my natural inclination. Like Paul, we would have to have a greater, more compelling vision than simply our own comfort, than simply our own security. There would be, have to be something that was more significant, more compelling to us. Paul writes later uh, in his letter to the Philippians, when Paul himself is sitting in jail, he writes in Philippians 1, starting verse 20, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, it's only when we begin to grasp the surpassing worth of Jesus and who he is and what it means to be in a relationship with him, to be in his presence, it's only when we get that that we'll want to follow him even when that following involves suffering because it's even more important to us to be in his presence. Sometimes it's only when everything is taken away from you. And some of you know this from experience. Sometimes it's only when everything has been stripped away, when you feel like you have nothing except Jesus, that you begin to experience that Jesus really is enough, that he really actually is sufficient, that he actually is all that you really need. But sometimes it takes the stripping away of everything else that you have been finding your comfort in and everything else that you've been standing on for you to be able to experience planting your feet on the solid rock of Jesus and saying, wow, he's enough to sustain me, to hold me up. He's all that I need. Many of you are facing your own challenges, your experiences of suffering. Some of you have various health conditions that you're dealing with. Some of you are experiencing the illness of a loved one. Some of you are experiencing the loss of transition. Maybe there are major life choices before you, changes in a job, changes in where you live or go to school. And while it's often the case that we get to pick what is going to be most enjoyable and most fulfilling to us, there are times in our lives, if you're a follower of Jesus, times directed by Jesus, when we're called to walk towards something that we know is not going to be comfortable, something that's going to involve suffering. But here's the good news. If you are a follower of Jesus, you will never make that journey on your own. You'll never be alone. Jesus has gone before you and he promises to continue to be with you. And Jesus is a king who has already died on a cross in order to rescue you. And that's the greatest possible demonstration of his love for you, which means that you can trust him. You can trust him no matter what the windy path may be that he leads you down, even in the valley of the shadow of death. Because Jesus is a king who's already died for us, 
we can follow him wherever he leads. Because he's already walked into suffering for us, we can follow him into suffering. So the Christian life is a journey. It's often a journey into suffering and it's a journey of following our king. And it's also a journey we see that is supported by fellowship. We're not alone. We're never meant to be alone. The Christian life is never meant to be an individual sport. We're not intended to be self-sufficient. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you do have a personal relationship, but it's never in isolation. When Jesus saves and rescues people, he rescues them into something, and that something is a community called the church. And so we see in Paul's experience, if you look at verse 4, when they get to Tyre, Paul and his traveling companions sought out the disciples there, those other followers of Jesus in this place. And he says, we stayed there for seven days. So they received hospitality. They probably received lodging. They probably were fed meals. They experienced fellowship with these other followers of Jesus. In verse five, Luke says, when our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, these people who lived in Tyre, with wives and children accompanied us until we were outside the city and kneeling down on the beach, we prayed. So these other Christians, believers, were praying with Paul and his companions as they were leaving. When we get to verse seven, Luke says, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. So again, they're being uh, the recipients of hospitality. In verse eight, on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. He says in verse 10, while we were staying for many days. And then verse 15, after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem, up because it was going up in elevation. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. And so Paul's going with his companions to all these various places and they're on their way somewhere. But Luke makes a specific point of telling us that there were other believers at all of these different stops who were engaged with them, who helped support them and meet their needs, who prayed with them. And so we see the importance of Christian fellowship and hospitality. I've got to admit that when I go on a trip, I am always inclined to pack way too much. And uh, some of my pastor friends here who have gone on retreats with me uh, know this and they make fun of me because, you know, they show up to pick me up and I drag out suitcase after suitcase. And I'm like, we're only going away for a couple of days. It's just a small retreat. But, um, but I take too much and I go snowboarding and I take a backpack stuffed with all kinds of things. You know, I got to go with one of you a couple days ago and it was 40 degrees and sunny. Um, but I had my backpack with enough, enough extra clothing in there to be comfortable if it dropped to negative 20. And an extra pair of gloves in case you drop one, which I've never lost a glove, but I've got them there just in case. And why do I do this? Because I want to know and feel like I've got everything I need to be comfortable, to take care of myself, to be self-sufficient. And sometimes we can approach the Christian life in the same way to think, I've got everything that I need. But Jesus doesn't actually want his followers to live that way or to act that way. In fact, when we live that way, it can actually contradict the message of the gospel that we're seeking to communicate to people. That we're not self-sufficient, we're able to take care of ourselves. That's what the gospel says, that we've got a problem so big we can't fix it ourselves. We have to get help from outside. So are you depending on Jesus in ways that people around you can see, can observe? Sometimes it's possible for those of us who are followers of Jesus to come off as though we have no needs. Our lives are pretty much all together. We're pretty much able to clean up our own messes. Friends who are here who are exploring Christianity, you're not a follower of Jesus yet. We hope you are, but will be. But maybe that, maybe that has been your experience as you have been around Christians, that Christians in the church seem to be a group of people who think they have it all together, 
who don't really have any problems and, and simply exist to tell other people how to be better. Christian friends, our message of God's grace will only be believable if we are depending upon that grace ourselves. So do people around you see that you have needs? And most particularly, here's, here's our greatest need. Do they see that you have a need, an ongoing need to be forgiven? How would they know that? Well, they would know that because you acknowledge your brokenness. You acknowledge your failings. If you've got people in your life, close friends or a spouse or children, do they know that you know that you need to be forgiven? The only way they would know that is if you are regularly saying to them, you know what? I did this thing. I said this. Uh, That was wrong. I shouldn't do that. Will you forgive me? You know what? Daddy spoke really harshly to you. That was not right. Dads shouldn't talk that way to their kids. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Do people see that you yourself are dependent? And then practically what we, what we glean from Paul and his companions experience here is the need for us to be connected, to help meet one another's needs. And most significantly, to pray for one another. So do you have people in your life who know you well enough that they would know what some of your needs are, who would know you well enough to to know how to pray for you. And maybe this is the opportunity for you to say, you know what, I don't really have anybody in my life uh, that knows me that well, that knows what's going on with me. And so maybe now is the opportunity to, to start to seek that out. And the good news is that we have avenues here. We have structures. We have small groups um, that we would love to help you get connected with. We have groups of people who meet at different times throughout the week in different parts of the city. And those are great places to be in relationship with people who will know what's going on with you, who will know when you need a meal or when you need to be prayed for or when you need help moving or various things like that. So let me encourage you, uh, talk to one of us. We've got a staff member, Chad, who uh, would love to help you get connected in a group like that. The final thing that we want to see here is that the Christian life involves becoming all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. And Paul arrives in Jerusalem and he recounts how the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done, has gone out to the Gentiles. And so after they arrive in Jerusalem, Luke tells us in verse 19, after greeting them, he related, this is Paul, related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. Um, when they heard it, they glorified God. And so here's what's, what's going on here. Um, Paul is the, the primary evangelist to the Gentiles, to people who are not Jews. And he has been out on three different missionary journeys going to all of these far off places. And many representatives from the churches that he has started uh, have come with him to Jerusalem. And he's talking about all that God has been doing among the Gentiles. And he's meeting there with James, who is the current leader of the church in Jerusalem and also kind of the leader of the Jewish Christians um, throughout the world and all these various elders. And they're rejoicing as they're hearing about how the gospel is being received by the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. And they also say to him, verse 20, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. So We're excited about God's work among the Gentiles out there. And guess what? He's also been causing thousands of our Jewish friends to become Christians, to believe in Jesus. And and there's a concern though. He says, they are all zealous for the law and they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews out there where you're out among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. Now, Paul had not actually been doing that. He had not been telling Jewish Christians, hey, you need to stop observing Jewish practices. Um, 
But there was this rumor going around that that's what he had been doing. And so there was, there was cause for alarm in Jerusalem. Now, a couple of things we want to just kind of set the stage for what's actually taking place here and what's not taking place. So Paul, the primary evangelist to the Gentiles, and James, who is the leader of the Jewish Christians, both share the exact same theology. They are both agreed upon the good news of the gospel and how you get saved. And they're both agreed that salvation is only by grace through faith in Jesus alone. It's not through keeping the law. They've already clearly communicated that. And they've also, they've said, you know, when Gentile people become Christians, they do not need to also become Jewish. They don't need to observe all of these Jewish customs and traditions. Um, they said that very clearly. They had a council together in Acts chapter 15. They said, these are the only things that we're going to ask the Gentiles who become Christians to observe. Um, but there was this concern that, hey, Paul is telling, telling Jewish Christians that they shouldn't do all of these, um, shouldn't do these other things. They shouldn't circumcise their children. And, um, and Paul's not doing that. And so to keep the peace, to keep unity, James and the elders say, hey, here's our plan. Here's what you need to do. We've got these four men who have taken a vow, most likely what's called a Nazarite vow. It's talked about in the Old Testament book of Numbers in chapter six, where basically uh, people would abstain from wine and other strong drink, and they wouldn't cut their hair. No, I'm not. I didn't take a Nazarite vow. Um, they wouldn't cut their hair for a period of time. Um, and it would have this, a similar function as fasting, where they are uh, doing something to express their devotion to God um, for a particular reason, for a time. And then at the end of that period of time, they would cut their hair, they would offer sacrifices. Um, and so they tell Paul, hey, you should purify yourself with them and you should pay for their expenses. And when you do that, then it'll be clear to everybody that you yourself are not jettisoning all of our Jewish heritage and you're not speaking poorly about it or telling people not to do it. Um, but as for the Gentiles, they say, verse 25, who have believed, we've sent a letter with our judgment that they should simply do these things, abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality. And so the main principle that we see here that we can take away from what's going on with Paul here in Jerusalem is that Paul was so compelled by his calling to share the good news of what Jesus has done to all kinds of people in all kinds of places that he was willing to, to jettison different cultural practices or embrace different cultural practices in order to not create unnecessary barriers to anybody hearing about Jesus and what he has done. So he was putting into practice here what he wrote in his letter, 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, where he says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means, I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And so Jesus wants to see the good news of the gospel go to all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And that's what we've been seeing taking place in the book of Acts. That's what he's about. And so we like Paul must be willing to become all things to all kinds of people. To not compromise the gospel, Paul says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel, not at the risk of the gospel. So our theology is fixed, who Jesus is and what he's done. But what we do, our methodology should be flexible, adaptable. We should be willing to adapt in the non-essentials according to the place we find ourselves, the culture we find ourselves, the particular people that God places in front of us to communicate the hope of the gospel. We should be willing to sacrifice in some sense in order to not create unnecessary barriers for people hearing about Jesus. 
to contextualize. So there's been a lot here and we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of miles, literally hundreds. Uh, But what we've seen is that the following Jesus is a journey uh, that often leads to suffering. And we need an encouragement to take each successive step following Jesus, particularly when we know that it's going to be costly and uncomfortable. And so what we're reminded of, particularly this coming week, is that Jesus is a king who's already gone to the cross for us. And so we can have confidence following him, knowing he won't leave us, knowing he will take care of us. We'll close with these words from what's known as the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer number one, which poses this question to us. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And Christians, followers of Jesus, can answer this way. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And so when you are secure in Jesus's love for you, it's then and only then that you will really be freed to follow him wherever he might lead you. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you that you have already demonstrated your great love for sinners like us in that while we were sinners, not when we'd cleaned ourselves up, but while we were still in the mire, your father sent you and you came in order to die and rescue people like us to be your own treasured possession. As we come to your table, would you assure us once again of your great love for us. And then would you use that love to encourage us to continue taking the next step in following you until our path leads us home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.